Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program um, here at CSIS, and I'm thrilled to be hosting my colleague, Seth Jones, um, uh, who has released his new book, A Covert Action, Reagan, the CIA, and the Cold War Struggle in Poland is available, I'm sure, online and in bookstores near you. It yes? is, yes. Very good. Seth, um, we're so lucky, is here at CSIS. He holds the Harold Brown Chair and is Director of the Transnational Threats Project and also a Senior Advisor to the International Security Program. Um, he also is an adjunct professor at uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies right across the street. So um, what we're going to do here is we're going to talk a little bit between us about the book and uh, maybe some of the implications of the book for today and then open it up uh, to the audience. So please be thinking of questions that you, uh, you'd you like Tough to questions. ask. Tough questions. Um, well, let's just start with you setting the stage, Seth. Um, you, your previous books have focused on everything from Afghanistan to you know, chasing Al Qaeda, if you will, post 9-11. They were more contemporaneous histories, and here you've jumped back in time to look at this Cold War um, history of how the U.S. supported solidarity. What brought you to that topic? Uh, it was, it's a, in some ways, was a business decision from Norton, which is the publisher. <laughs> They, they took a look at the market for terrorism books and said, saturated, your last one was on terrorism, the one before that, um, let's look at a bunch of options. So I went back to the um, drawing board, mm -hmm. looked at a range of options. One of the things uh, that I came across was uh, in looking at, at Russian activity, for example, that there had been a program that had come out in a few places in um, Gates from the Shadows, mm -hmm. uh, where he talked about the CIA's assistance to solidarity, yep. but it was never, it was not an acknowledged program, a covert action program. It had come through a couple of other uh, external publications that had made their way through the review board at CIA, um, but there was not a lot of public information, so I started digging a little bit in the archives, mm -hmm. and turns out there was a lot more information than I had anticipated. So went back to the publisher and they said, bingo, uh, this, is a, this is a great story. Um, and so it was the story itself that sold this, not the, not the background yeah, of me, yeah. for example. So talk a little bit about um, the context you know, that's laid out in the book, which is, I have actually read the book and it is a fantastic read that I recommend to everyone. But I think um, just you know, for those who are stuck in today, if you will, help us understand what solidarity was all about and, and what the meaning of Poland and solidarity was to the Soviet Union and the US um, at this point in time that you are intersecting with your book. Sure. Well, I think what, what people have to remember is uh, in 1945 at Yalta, uh, Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt had uh, essentially agreed as part of the grand bargain that um, Eastern Europe, including Poland, and this is the way at least Stalin interpreted it, uh, would fall under the Soviet sphere of influence. And that's essentially with, with the, quote, elections that happened in Poland, that's the way the rest of the Cold War ended up uh, going. So what you had is with uh, the beginning of an opposition movement that starts to form in 1980, it looks like there is a crack in, um, in Eastern Europe. And you have this uh, first in Gdansk at the mm -hmm. shipyard, and then in some of the mines, you have a growing um, labor union that wants more independence. Uh, and wants to be self-governing and look, starts to look more like a political movement than mm -hmm. just a labor union. And so both August 1980, which is when Solidarity reaches its major agreement um, to become a self-governing independent trade union, and right after that, the election of Reagan, who wants to be a little bit more combative against the Soviet Union, as does his CIA director, those two things are happening within two or three months of each other. And I think it's that convergence that starts this book, which is um, an active uh, opposition movement inside, behind the Iron Curtain. And actually, it's, you can see it in the first couple of months of the Reagan administration, by far the most important foreign policy issue is Poland. And, and, and it looks like it's going to be a Soviet invasion at that point. Yeah. So you, you raised already the, the element of what's happening in the US. You have, you have of course, Reagan elected. You, you also have this background about CIA and covert action that's been building over time. You have the backdrop from the 
76 era of the church and pike committees. You have the backdrop of Desert One from the Carter administration um, and the implications, if you will, gen generally speaking on special operations and intelligence um, and a real um, concern that has grown up through the US public and members of Congress about the use, the way in which we use covert action overseas. But in comes Reagan and in comes with him Bob Casey. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about you know yeah. how how that changed under them. Well, uh, and, and even before that, at the in in the Carter administration, you obviously had Afghanistan. Yes. So that was a that was really probably one of the key turning points because mm -hmm. there the That's CIA was asked to provide paramilitary assistance to the Mujahideen. Um, so when when Reagan comes in, CIA is already starting to rebound a bit on the covert action side. It's, it's starting to transfer weapons into the Mujahideen. This is a political action program. Right. There are no weapons involved in the discussions in 1982. Uh, in, so in December of 1981, uh, the Soviets decide they're not going to invade uh, like, like they did in Czechoslovakia in 1968. What they're going to do instead is get the Poles to do it for them, right. act as their surrogates. So December of 1981, we get martial law. We get the major crackdown on solidarity. And Lech Wałęsa is captured. A number of senior solidarity leaders are captured. And so 1982, the discussion is, what do we do? And one of the interesting things is, with some lessons for today, uh, the administration is also looking at the broader Soviet information campaign directed against right. them across the globe. Uh, they begin to hold hearings. Um, at that time, they were called Soviet active measures. And they were a global information campaign that included everything from targeted assassinations to forgeries to disinformation. Um, and, and the U.S., I think Reagan administration officials assess anyway has was largely on the defensive, right? Uh, trying to find ways to block them, to highlight them, and this was an opportunity, I think, uh, to in 1982 to go on the offensive. Yep, you there. There are two um, quotes I'd like to just pull on that. One is this about the Soviet view of what the U.S. is doing, and one is about the U.S. view of what the Soviets are doing. On the Soviets, you, you say, as one Soviet document concluded, CIA and other government information programs were designed to conduct a, quote, global psychological war against the USSR and socialist countries, unquote, and to target the ideology of communism. And to what you just said, um, you have this quote, Casey argued in a sensitive memo that, quote, most of these active measures that you just discussed are not new. Many of them were employed by Lenin and Stalin and by others throughout history. At no time in this century, however, have these techniques been used with more effect or sophistication than by the current Soviet state. So you sort of see on both sides of this, right, this yeah. view of active measures and, and how they're going to play a role in the ongoing, you know, battleground, if you will, of, of the future of Poland. So why don't you step us through the program that CIA sets up, mm -hmm. what it's designed to do, and, and how it goes. So uh, the discussions occur across 1982. Uh, there is some discussion of weapons uh, procurement. Do solidarity, does solidarity need weapons? Um, Someone actually goes down to the farm, looks at weapons stockpiles. But I think most people involved in the program decide, uh, and especially ones that I talk to, especially at the principal's level, so Reagan, um, his vice president, George H.W. Uh, Bush, and others, that solidarity is not asking for weapons. It's really asking for uh, help in running an underground. Because that's what it is. It's an opposition political movement. So what CIA decides to do, and there's a November 1982 finding that the president signs, is to, um, is to provide money, largely, that is going into um, helping the underground function. And that includes um, everything you'd need to run the print side of it, so paper, mm -hmm. poster boards, uh, ink, duplicator machines, Xerox machines. Uh, it includes some technical help. You need to run a radio station, a clandestine radio station, so technical help in running radio solidarity. And then eventually technical help in breaking into uh, television programs like the Evening News. There's a great story from a New York Times reporter, uh, Michael Kaufman, who is brought to a, um, uh, a, 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 a apartment complex in the Warsaw area. And he's sat down, these are solidarity activists he's with, and they ask him to watch the, the news. And 
And during the evening news that evening, there is a banner that flashes across the screen that says Solidarity Lives. Huh. And then there's another one that uh, comes up right after that, which tells people to tune into a certain radio frequency um, where they can hear Radio Solidarity. So that assistance was uh, facilitated by CIA to help break into the news program. So those are the kinds of things that, that CIA did. And, and what's important to note here, because people often ask me, you know, what, what, did, what did Solidarity think of all this? Um, this was a covert action program, so uh, they generally didn't know. They mm -hmm. had suspicions of what was going on. But the way this worked was to think of this as a series of surrogates. So you're recruiting as assets individuals that were already bringing material by truck or by boat uh, in through the Baltic Sea right. or by land through West, uh, West Germany into the east. and. Um, at each point along the way, stuff would get unloaded, uh, loaded again into a new truck. By the time it reached a certain underground, mm -hmm. uh, hidden in somebody's basement, uh, that was actually using the duplicator machine, it had probably passed seven, eight, nine, ten series of hands along the way. There never was a connection. connection right. There never was a case officer really meeting a member of Solidarity. It was designed to hide the hand of the U.S. government, which is what it did very effectively, because the KGB, which was uh, all over this, never identified any specific example yeah. of CIA They support. suspected it. They strongly suspected it. Right. Yeah. What, what was, the, was it your assessment that the U.S. took that approach as a, a, largely as a political risk management or for other, any other reasons? I mean, I spoke to case officers involved in this uh, and, and, and the folks at Langley at that time that were involved in putting it together. And they said it was basically to minimize the risk of right. uh, being identified. Right. Um, also, to make it more legitimate, so that uh, you know, because there were uh, the, the Brussels Solidarity Office was heavily penetrated by the KGB, mm. so uh, it made little sense to try to recruit people out of Brussels because uh, they would have been identified pretty quickly. Um, plus, they were what they were also doing was <laughs> leveraging already legitimate, uh, essentially. Think of them as black market smugglers. They were already they were they were already leveraging people that were well known within the right. um, uh, community, that were strong solidarity supporters, um, and nobody suspected at that point anyway that they were working with a foreign government. So one big thread in the story, which ties in here, but in other ways, is the role of the Catholic Church, specifically Pope John Paul, um, who's become is Polish and has become the Pope, but also priests and how they operate in this. Why don't you talk a little bit about how we should think about the role that the church provided, both individual members and then institutionally, how that played out inside the dynamics of Poland at the time, and maybe what the limits of that yeah. description are. I mean, there's a bit of a myth that comes out in some of the literature at the end of the Cold War that the U.S. government, particularly the CIA and the Catholic Church, had this <coughs> holy alliance that had worked together to provide assistance to solidarity. Uh, the reality, uh, at least as, as I looked at it, as I peeled back the onion, was um, slightly different. This was a U.S. program. Uh, the U.S. did cooperate, including U.S. intelligence, did cooperate with the British, a uh, major ally. Outside of that, uh, the cooperation was a little bit different. Certainly senior U.S. officials, including Reagan, Reagan was not Catholic, but he was very sympathetic. Um, he was nearly assassinated right around the same time that the Pope was, so they had a bond mm -hmm. together. And, uh, and they met frequently um, and would communicate quite a bit. Much of that has been declassified. So uh, there, was a, there was a bond between those two. There were other Catholics on Reagan's staff, including Casey himself, mm -hmm that would brief and sit down and talk with the, with the Pope. And so for U.S. officials, the Catholic Church was an ally. The Catholic Church was an organization that had tremendous influence within Polish society. It was, um, it was an organization that housed Solidarity members, let them meet in its uh, church uh, offices and, and meeting rooms. Uh, it would facilitate the delivery of some of this. Um, and then several different Pope visits to Poland started to open up the aperture to provide more legitimacy to solidarity. But for the most part, it was never 
tactical or even operational mm -hmm. connections. There were a few occasions where I did find um, the, the CIA used priests to bring money in. Mm -hmm. Priests generally weren't checked at the border in Poland, but these were this was such a small percentage mm -hmm. of the funding that ended up going into Poland uh, that it's an overstatement, a heavy overstatement to call this a uh, some kind of a holy alliance. The reality is there was a lot of cooperation, a lot of discussion. The specific program I looked at was largely done within U U.S. confines. Mm -hmm. So the program, if I'm saying it right, QR Helpful, is that how? QR Helpful, QR helpful? Kryptonym, yes. Um, the, it, take us kind of to the end of the movement of solidarity and the shifts in Poland and how you assess the degree to which QR Helpful was a, yeah. was a component of that story. The, what, what you actually see, and, it's, and it is worth noting, is um, especially in the early part of the, uh, of the 1980s, uh, CIA was by far the largest source of external assistance to solidarity. There was funding coming from other places, some foreign governments, uh, labor unions, which had a uh, strong sympathetic uh, support network to solidarity. Uh, including in the U.S., the AFL-CIO did provide money and assistance. Um, there is some data on the amounts of funding that went in. Uh, it looks like um, CIA's assistance was significantly more. Uh, the, total, the, the, the total amount over the course of the 80s uh, that the CIA provided was just under $20 million, um, and uh, no, no one came close to anything along those lines. But, but when you look at it in context, um, what you see is the early period when solidarity is most under stress is where the bulk of CIA assistance actually happened. By the end of the 80s, as solidarity becomes uh, a little bit stronger in many ways, uh, Gorbachev institutes Glasnost and Perestroika. We have roundtable discussions in 1989. Then you get a lot of overt assistance, National Endowment for Democracy. <laughs> Other governments start to give more, so that need for covert assistance starts to decrease. And 1989 is really the key year for Poland because late 88 and early 89, we have the roundtable discussions. They agree to elections. Solidarity does absolutely fantastic in 1989. And then in 1990, uh, Lech Wałęsa is elected as the president of Poland. Um, and, uh, and so solidarity then moves from nearly being destroyed at the end of 1981 to having the leader of the country as a member of solidarity. So that assistance that from CI, I think certainly helped in the early years. The other thing that's sort of interesting along these lines is uh, CIA did help a little bit level the playing field in the 1989 elections. Um, the uh, state owned, uh, the, the media in Poland was still largely state owned. Mm -hmm. So CIA did support solidarity a bit in the elections. And there's one sort of um, fantastic, uh, it's, a, it's a photograph of Gary Cooper. And oh. Gary Cooper, um, it's a photograph from High Noon, if you've seen the movie. And in the movie uh, picture of it, Gary Cooper's holding a six-shooter. Well, CIA lawyers decided that it would be problematic for uh, a billboard to go up with Gary Cooper, with solidarity in the background, holding a six-shooter. So the lawyer said, can't do it. Um, how about we have him holding a ballot? So the six-shooter was pulled out, the ballot was put in, and there we have Gary Cooper as one of the many symbols of the election um, uh, with solidarity behind him holding a ballot. Yeah, and you also get a sense from the book, first of all, that the, I, I do think we, my fault, we kind of rushed over, that, that solidarity was very near collapse, if you will. So the CIA had to make some hard decisions about staying in the game. And you, you explain that well in the book, that, that, that in fact, the, the, those who wanted to stay invested, stay invested. Um, but also this idea that um, not only do, can others come in materially to help at the, uh, overtly later, but the messaging start, it seems like starts to become much more important, the fact that the West is with yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about sort of that and maybe a little yeah. about Reagan himself yeah. and how the role he played? Yeah, I mean, you can see it right off the bat. Ra Reagan in his memoirs, if you go through his memoirs, um, starts to view solidarity for better or worse. He views it as, and he says this in his National Security Council meetings, he views solidarity as struggling for freedom, not entirely unlike what um, was happening 
at the beginning of the United States with uh, those that f helped found the country were s struggling for freedom. He begins to equate those two, and he actually says it in speeches. So when solidarity comes under extraordinary duress, Reagan views this as not just a way to weaken the Soviet Union in its Eastern European uh, area, sphere of influence, but also a way to support a legitimate democratic movement. So, I mean, for him, this is exactly what he's been preaching. He's been preaching the spreading of democracy um, and freedom. This works to his advantage in many ways. One of the things that is interesting as he, um, I mean, there, there, there are a couple things that I think begin to tie him closely into Poland. Uh, the uh, Polish ambassador to the United States, right around the time of martial law, defects to the U.S. Right. President greets him at the White House. Um, uh, he, Reagan is then encouraged right around Christmas time to give a Christmas message to the American public, a holiday message to the American public. And he asks every American, much like they were doing in Poland, to light a candle and put it in their windows as a signal of hope and freedom. So as I was going through the archives in Simi Valley, the Reagan archives, I came across a stack of, of letters that Reagan received from solidarity members in prison. Somehow they'd been smuggled out of the country. And many of them said, what you are doing, the words are helpful, but the fact that the American president recognizes the struggle and supports it keeps the movement alive because we know we have some kind of a backstop mm -hmm. in the United States. And so I think it was a source of inspiration, setting aside the whole funding network, right. that somebody in Washington and the government uh, was sympathetic to the cause and was willing to talk about it publicly. Yeah. So um, we're going to talk about where we are today in just a moment, but linking then and now, I, I couldn't help when reading this book but think about the fact that through part of this period, just over the border in East Germany, we had sitting one Vladimir Putin. Did you find anything in your research that indicated either, um, because the, East, the KGB out of East Germany is, is, is critical in how critical. Poland is managed in the Soviet sphere. Um, and, and any sense of his um, thoughts following that period of time, how the whole approach on solidarity in the West essentially having a victory, if you will, through that, how that may have affected his viewpoints? Not so much with Putin himself. I didn't come across any discussions or um, any comments on Putin and Poland, at yeah. least at that period, but lots on the KGB. And, you know, the, the, the KGB had this sense that this, kind of, that, that this kind of assistance was going on. They had a very hard time stopping it. And, and what's interesting is by the end of the 1980s, things have switched over so dramatically that the CIA is recruiting from within the security services mm. of Eastern European countries. So not only has the KGB lost uh, most of Eastern Europe in its, in its view, but it's also had its, its client security services completely mm -hmm. penetrated um, and in many cases had people defect. Mm. So if you're looking at this like a football game, um, they're losing big uh, by the end of the Cold War. So that anger is very uh, palpable in reading the Matrokin archives, for example, where, where, we, where he brought out a range of that activity. Um, the other thing that's interesting about the KGB is how angry they were at the Catholic Church mm -hmm. uh, for providing at least nominal assistance to solidarity. Mm -hmm. So the KGB is, um, is you know, really on the defensive in Poland. Yeah. So uh, here we are today. Uh, active measures is something we talk about in Washington. Um, talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you would think about that time frame when we thought of ourselves as in a Cold War, and a lot of these measures went back and forth. Um, although I'm not equating them, um, and we're going to talk about that. But and then today, I mean, do you think we are in a similar situation where propaganda or information operations? you know, are an expected part of how we debate, you know, and dialogue below the threshold of war? Or are we looking at a different kind of reality than we were looking at then? I think by the 1980s, it was pretty clear. I mean, the Cuban Missile Crisis had already come and gone. It was pretty clear that uh, it was unlikely, not impossible, but unlikely we were going to see U.S.-Soviet 
nuclear or conventional uh, war. Mm -hmm. uh, they had, both sides had come to the precipice uh, right around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis and didn't like what they saw about what the impact would be uh, for anybody that's read any of the great Graham Allison work or others. And, mm -hmm. and so this then, uh, by the 80s, was irregular, unconventional uh, activity. And so I think this is where the Soviets really start to surge is they conduct a pretty aggressive offensive information campaign. Not unlike today, uh, key components of it involve disinformation, forgeries, uh, you know, offensive action. What's different, I think, um, about that period and the way the U.S. handles it, at least during that period, was the U.S. starts to uh, shift from a purely defensive position to an offensive one. And there are, there are a couple of national security decision directives that come from the National Security Council that uh, one is on U.S. national security strategy, second one is on Eastern Europe, and another then is on the Soviet Union. And what they do is, uh, is a couple of key things. One is they put information essentially on the same playing field as military instruments mm -hmm. of power, uh, diplomacy, development assistance, so information operations gets pushed to the top, much like the Soviets were doing to the right. U.S. at that point. The second is uh, the U.S. decides it's going to go on the offensive, mm -hmm. and that is they're going to find vulnerabilities and weaknesses in the Soviet system, and that also includes in Eastern Europe. So the uh, Soviets have decided that they're, they're going to push propaganda, they're going to fund front groups in the United States in the 1980s, people often forget this, uh, the World Peace Council uh, and, the, and uh, the nuclear freeze movement in the mm -hmm. U.S. Uh, were at least partly funded by KGB, that the, uh, the administration decides it's going to go on the offensive in Eastern Europe and potentially in the Soviet Union itself. So um, puts together an interagency active measures working group, which brings together folks from across the U.S. intelligence community, the Doesn't FBI. it have some incredibly innocuous name like the Interagency Policy <laughs> Council, I feel? Like. Is, doesn't it have some... It, it, that's actually usually the, the giveaway, right? It, it, if it's it got an actually, incredibly innocuous name. The organization, and I talked to uh, some of the people that pulled it together, it was the Active Measures Working Group. Oh, okay. That's All what right. it was oh, called. Well, there you have it, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was designed to uh, publicly identify examples of Soviet disinformation right. and then push it out publicly, yeah. including with congressional hearings. But most of the people that sat on it also had an operational uh, end. So it combined defensive measures with mm -hmm. an ability to go on the offensive. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of getting a handle right now on the defensive part, including bringing in the private sector. Um, the offensive part, I think, we're not, we're not there. So talk a little more about that. When you say we're not there on the offensive side, what are some things that you would want to see and pull into that? You know, where are the boundaries? You know, where, where is it ethically appropriate, right. if you will, or are there boundaries? Right. Uh, well, uh, so if we take a page out of the, the sort of older Cold War playbook, the last part of the Cold War, um, stuff that, w that one might consider would be, uh, w would be um, not disinformation, because I, I think the U.S. largely stayed away from significant amounts of disinformation forgeries. Mm -hmm. So there were some differences between that and, and Soviet active measures. Instead, it was highlighting challenges. Uh, there was corruption within the Politburo. Uh, there were demonstrations uh, and protests across parts of Eastern Europe. Uh, there were human rights abuses in places where the Soviets were involved, including in the KGB. Part of the question today is, uh, th th there are a couple of things. One is, how effective of an interagency working group do we have? Um, I mean, my sense right now is we're kind of in the early period of, of if on the terrorism front after 9-11, it took a little bit of time to put together what we now have as the National Counterterrorism Center. We're still a little bit uh, in the early days of pulling together some kind of interagency organizational structure mm -hmm. along those lines. So that's, that's one interesting uh, lesson is a, some kind of an organizational structure that allows us 
uh, to pull together what we know and then also where we can uh, think about how to respond. Right. But, but, but again, the, the uh, part of, I think, the brilliance of offense during this period, during this Reagan period, is they were simply highlighting actions that were going on mm -hmm. and making sure that the American public, that Europeans and that others across the globe were aware of, of Soviet actions, not just responding to Soviet disinformation or forgeries. Yeah. So that's a lot less about disinformation, us, the U.S. providing this, and more about highlighting, again, corruption, human rights abuses, right. those kinds of actions. Right. And I'm going to come to the audience in just a minute, but I do want to ask a final question, which is, how did you manage to time your book release for the day after the president of Poland came to visit President Trump? Because that is impressive. Dumb luck. Well, I, that's <laughs> hard to believe. <laughs> uh, what, what I would say is this, though. It is, it is interesting that, that um, we are at a period where many Poles have accused their government of um, putting a bit of a, of a, you know, of, of becoming a little bit more autocratic and authoritarian, yeah, including uh, towards the justices, yes, you know, more than just yes. a little. Right. Uh, with, with more information coming out about the U.S. supporting during the Cold War the, uh, the, lib the, the freedom, liberation of, right. of solidarity. So it's, it's a bit of irony yes. in, the, in, the, in the visit and the history involved here. Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely the case. All right, so um, it, we're going to call on folks now with questions. When I call on you, please um, stand up, state your name, ask your question, and we'll move on. So we'll start right over here. And the microphone's coming. Oh, hold on just a second. There's a microphone coming for you. There you go. Oleg hmm. Mirkul of Business Baltic Media Group from Riga, Latvia. Uh, in what ways uh, the experience of uh, covered actions in Poland in early 90s, uh, yeah, early 80s, I'm sorry, uh, was uh, used in uh, uh, Baltic states uh, at hmm. the end of 80s, beginning of 90s, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, at that time uh, part of the Soviet Union? Uh, what are the similarities and differences? Thank you. It's a good question. Uh, what were the similarities and differences? Um, I looked pretty closely at the Polish program. Um, uh, I don't know specifically, and I don't think much of it's been declassified about what happened, if anything, mm. in the Baltic states. But I would note that there has been um, another related program that has come out and, uh, in the last year or two, and that's the book program. So another thing that CIA did on the information uh, side, which has become not just declassified, but there have been some uh, major public books on it, is it ran a campaign to get books from bookstores in places like uh, London into the hands of um, individuals across Eastern Europe, and those included Baltic states. Those were generally books, magazines, and journals that were banned within those, uh, within right. those countries. So there, that was a separate program. Um, that would have actually included the Baltic states and the Soviet Union itself. So there were programs that I'm aware of that did get information out into those areas. But as to other activities in the Baltic states, uh, I'm just not aware of much becoming public at this point. Okay. Other questions? We have one right here. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey. I'm an Intel analyst and a former diplomat. Uh, to Dr. Hicks's point about limits, there's been some pretty good reportage that at some point we uh, slipped fud fudged uh, computer chips into aviation electronics at uh, Mikoyan and Sukhoi. And it worked. A number of planes fell out of the sky with the appropriate symptoms. But then a little bit later, a civilian aircraft fell out of the sky with appropriate symptoms, and CIA cut off the program. And, and I do think that raises a really interesting program, uh, question about covert action. If you can contaminate the supply chain of, of Daesh, for example, or the PKK, with perhaps unintended consequences, is that still an option for us? So uh, I, I would say, even at that period, uh, one might break covert action into two components. First is paramilitary. Mm -hmm. uh, that would include a number of paramilitary programs, including ones uh, directed into the, the uh, Afghanistan to support the Mujahideen through Pakistan. The second would be political programs. Um, and I think any covert action program, even on the political side, one has to be very careful 
uh, before even walking down that road. Um, what, what are the costs and benefits of doing it? What are the costs and benefits if, if, uh, if it gets discovered? Do you delegitimize those organizations? If there are discussions about lethal action, there are a whole range of yeah. risks involved. Um, so I, I think these are all very important questions that need to be asked. And one of the things that does strike me in looking at the um, administration's discussion of this in 1982 is there was a lot of debate about even the Polish program and whether to move forward in it. And it was debate involving uh, all the principles. It was debate within CIA. It was certainly debate within the special activities elements within CIA about the costs and benefits of a program like this. So, I mean, there are always mistakes in any organization's uh, covert action programs. And I think one has to be careful if any country is going to walk down this road. This seemed to be an example where a program was helpful, at least in the early years, because there was a legitimate local uh, entity that needed assistance, probably better to hide the hand of the US government in the early period so as not to delegitimize it. There were no weapons transferred. There was no lethal action. It was just money that went into buying duplicator machines and Xerox machine, Xerox machines and paper and, and those kinds of things. So in the cost benefit calculation, this seems to me one where I think you could make a pretty reasonable argument that the benefits outweigh the costs in history. That's not going to be the case with every, every uh, consideration. Yeah, and you, you also emphasized, you know, you did even here today, that, but in the book in particular, the, how unique or new or the, the indirect approach really was, the idea of trying to work very hard to not be in direct communication. I mean, the, prior to that point, had most programs CIA had pursued um, been really much more um, direct contact, if you will? It depends on the program. The, uh, I mentioned a little bit, the, uh, there's a program that starts in the 1950s to provide assistance to the Polish journal Kultura, mm -hmm. which was headquartered in Paris. There was a Polish community there. Uh, and that journal is smuggled into Poland. It's a very, very small program. So that was an indirect approach. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was to provide some funding to a, an opposition journal. I mean, not a lot of impact there. The book program, which had started beforehand in which uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was uh, here and was the national security advisor to President Carter, supported and continued during his time there. Uh, there were programs like that that were indir indirect and, and included surrogates as well even though there were obviously plenty of direct approaches, including ones that backfired in Latin America, right. among others. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I have questions. There's one way in the back, and then I'll come here. Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon. Brian Katz, visiting fellow here at CSIS. Seth, you mentioned that one of the critical elements of success of the program was, in fact, that it was secret despite the fact that it had been part of this active measures interagency working group, presumably briefed to Congress as well, uh, highest level of political officials of the Reagan administration aware of this, yet it remains secret. You compare that to today or over the last decade and the number of alleged covert action programs that end up on the front page of the New York Times. I'm curious in your research and in discussions uh, with those involved with the program, what was it that enabled it to remain secret? Um, was it the nature of the program, or is there something about that time that you would uh, contrast to today? Sure, a couple of things. One is, is obviously this was a covert action program, and legally, uh, with the finding, the administration had to let Congress know essentially immediately, and they were briefed on it. Um, and one of the concerns Congress had at that point, the intelligence committees, were, were leaks. Uh, so there was strong concern about leaks. Uh, what CIA did was essentially keep the number of people that knew about it to a tiny, tiny group. I mean, I even, what, the, the, there, there are a couple of things that struck me. A lot of analysts that worked on Poland mm. had no idea right. this program was going on, at least nothing uh, official. In fact, um, th there were now there are declassified CIA uh, analytical reports from this time, which 
it is clear as I read through them and as I talked to people involved in the program said that's definitely the case. They did not know, nor did CIA director of analysis reports indicate that they had knowledge of the program. So that meant that everybody, pretty much everybody on the analytical side was kept in the dark on specifics of the program because it didn't even always reach analytical products that were being pushed around. And so um, that, that also meant people in stations in Europe uh, that weren't on the operational side or didn't have a need to know were, including within that organization, uh, were often not aware uh, of it. May have heard rumors, but that's about it. And then, and then finally, I, I would highlight though that there was a lot of, that you know, there were some questions. Uh, there was a Polish television series in the mid-1980s about CIA support to solidarity. So there was some press, and if you go back and look at newspaper articles during that time period, you will see these suspicions of CIA support to solidarity. But what, what the KGB could never get is they could never get, they, they conducted a range of raids yeah. and ambushes and seizures of material at houses, and they grabbed people and interrogated them. They could never get definitive evidence along those lines. So, uh, you know, probably much like today, there were leaks that came out, but nothing that was too definitive. The set of people that knew about it was pretty small, and they did it in such a way that even if there were leaks, there was nothing definitive that, are, that ever became public. So there were other potential explanations for what was happening. Can you just spend a moment talking about the particular story? You mentioned it before of the, um, the, the, the Polish intelligence officer who's who is exfiltrated at the point at which he's pretty sure that the that the um, KGB is on to him he comes to the United States and then there's a whole if you will story that goes on if about him and how he um, is outed if you will by the polls and how the US decides yeah. to counter that because I think that's also part of this story of how you know how visible was it that the US was engaged yeah right so uh, Rizard Kuklinski is a Polish military officer and in the 1970s he he's involved in some of the war planning for what a um, NATO uh, Warsaw Pact conventional or even nuclear war might look like and and he I mean it's just, just it doesn't sit well with him so he sends a, a letter I printed some of that in the book to the US uh, to the US Embassy wants to meet with military officers uh, on his he's got a what, what ends up being an espionage visit to um, to Western Europe by boat uh, along the Baltic Sea and then <coughs> further along uh, he is met at the at the location and at the time that he indicates by two CIA case officers who uh, recruit him. I mean, he, they don't have to really. He's basically volunteered his services and provides information on Soviet uh, war planning, Warsaw Pact war planning. Um, and his motivation is primarily to um, prevent any kind of conventional or nuclear war and to save lives. Uh, as martial law, as we get closer to martial law in December of 1981, and we get into the fall of 1981, uh, there is more and more concern about a potential Soviet invasion. And it's not entirely clear how this leak happens. There is some, there's some <coughs> informed speculation that there was a leak a Soviet uh, KGB spy in the Vatican mm. that learns about it potentially in part from being told by Americans in the Vatican, learns that the U.S. has a source in uh, very high up involved in, the, in Polish war plans. So he's interviewed uh, at the end of 1981 and only a few other people would have had access to these war plans. So CIA makes this incredible uh, escape, brings he and his family out, Kuklinski out, uh, resettles him in the United States. Interestingly, um, both of his sons are killed in very mysterious circumstances in the United States. Uh, so uh, he outlives them. There are a lot of speculation on one, one was run over by a car in a, uh, in a hit and run that was never solved. The other one drowned swimming alone. You can come to your own conclusions on what happened, uh, but very mysterious deaths. But he ends up being a very complicated pe person in Polish history because 
He insists he was a Polish patriot. Um, the Poles, at least under the Jaruzelski regime, call him a spy. Mm -hmm. This uh, is still, in the, just to be clear, still in the Soviet era. Still in the mm -hmm. Soviet era. In the, yeah. in the, in the, in the sort of post-Soviet era, yeah. you know, he is reinstated as a Polish citizen. I tracked his statue down in Gdynia and took a picture of it. It's actually in the book. Uh, there's a Kuklinski statue. It's kind of buried in, in one of the neighborhoods of, 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 um, uh, of Gdynia, right near the Baltic Sea. But, you know, there's a vibrant debate. Brzezinski is actually intimately involved in getting him repatriated in, in mm -hmm. Poland. But here's an interesting case about some, an individual who's part of the story that is torn between the East and the West. And his legacy is, mm -hmm. is certainly one that, um, that will, you know, that will be a subject of major discussion. But there's also this point, isn't there, where the Polish government essentially says he had these martial law plans. The CIA, he, the CIA must have known they could have stopped it. They're not really with you, solidarity. Isn't there sort of this messaging approach that's taken where where this issue of how visible is the CIA presence gets kind of pushed from the Polish end? Am I remembering that Yeah, correctly? so even during the Jaruzelski regime in yeah. the 1980s, um, the Poles leak out Kuklinski's name and say that the uh, U.S. government, including the CIA, had, they, they, they had a spy who had access to the war plans um, and they never told Solidarity, so they're not really for you. And there's right. a debate in, um, in Poland, even at that point, about whether the U.S. made a mistake by not alerting Solidarity to the fact that they had access to the war plans because Solidarity members were rounded up at the end of 1981 and in early 1982. And Kuklinski writes a huge reply. It's published in the, in the, in the journal Kultura saying, essentially, you're missing the mark here. Uh, the fact is, you, Jaruzelski, cracked down. Whether the U.S did anything or not is beside the point. The fact of the matter is that you cracked down. You're the ones who instituted martial law. Let's not forget that. So that, I think, partly settles the debate. Yeah, he never, if you will, cops to CIA role. No, yeah, yeah. right. All right, so we had a question right here. Uh, thank you. I just wanted you to uh, speak a little bit about uh, how solidarity did get nearly destroyed uh, uh, despite the help is provided? And is there is a relationship between uh, what happened in Poland and what led to the Soviet Union collapse? I, I heard that. The, the second half. That. Yeah. yeah, So, me I mean, on, on the point about um, CIA assistance and the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, I, I think one can heavily overstate the reality. Uh, the, I would say the assistance was helpful to uh, Solidarity surviving that dark period of the early 19 and mid-1980s, when it wasn't getting assistance from other places, and yet there was still a robust movement. But by the late 80s, there were a lot of other centrifugal forces that were occurring. There was, um, there was Gorbachev's Glasnost and Perestroika, which was opening up more debate. There were the economic problems that the Soviet Union was having. Uh, there were a range, there was nationalism that was occurring in a number of the former Soviet republics. There were other things that were going on. There was the, uh, the movements in East, Ger in East Germany, uh, including to reunify uh, the Czechs and Slovaks. That was Czechoslovakia still at the time. But there were a range of different f factors that were contributing to it. So I would just conclude by saying, I think the assistance was helpful in getting the outcome. It was not sufficient, nor was it necessarily deterministic that the Soviet Union would collapse. Uh, there are a whole range of other endogenous and exogenous factors that uh, contributed to it. But I think the fact that you did have the US uh, supporting uh, that uh, these opposition movements, including publicly speaking about them, certainly helped. And then as the, Soviet, as, as, as the Warsaw Pact started to crumble, there were a lot of very important discussions that even happened during the Bush administration about German reunification that were very delicate discussions, as well as under the Clinton administration, uh, the whole issue of NATO expansion. So, I mean, I think as we look at the period that comes kind of at the end of the book and then even in the years after that, there were some, uh, the, the, the U.S. role was important, 
Uh, but you know, the vast majority, in my view, of what happens in Eastern Europe is coming from populations themselves in Eastern Europe. And, and if you didn't have that kind of support, none of this would have happened uh, at all. So, I mean, most of the credit clearly goes to solidarity members like Lech Wałęsa and others along these lines. They're, they're the ones. I'm gonna take one last question. I think we have one right here. Thank you. Uh, Dick Hoffman, um, I'm a 31-year CIA veteran. A lot of it was in covert action, and a lot of it was when uh, Casey was director. And uh, just as kind of a comment, we were pushing back everywhere, not just in Eastern Europe, yes, not just in Afghanistan, but everywhere, and pushing back hard. Uh, this gentleman actually got a piece of my question. Um, given what I just said, and given the fact that we did help Solidarity, but we also helped the Mujahideen, and we uh, blocked the Russians and the Cubans, basically, in Central America, could I ask you to stretch yourself a little bit and kind of, what's the net? I mean, what, what role did the Casey CIA play in, in the collapse of the Soviet Union? Sure. Um, so. One of, the, one of the parts of the book I found really interesting was the time I spent at Hoover at Stanford University, because the Casey archives sit there. And there's been a little bit more that's opened up about Casey. The Reagan archives have a little bit more on Casey's role in a range of act actions overseas, uh, letters to the president, notes to the president, memorandums to the president, so we can see more than we could a couple of years ago of what Casey was doing and supporting and what actions were going on. Uh, I would say that, uh, that they were very helpful in turning this situation from putting the U.S. largely on the defensive in 1980 and early 1981 to the Soviets finding themselves actually competing everywhere. Rather than, I think the, the, it looks like when you look at some of the now declassified KGB assessments from the mid-1980s, the change that KGB assessments look like they have is they felt like they were winning the information war and they were winning in a range of places uh, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, late 70s and early 80s. By the mid 80s, they are competing in all of these places. And I think, you know, the US makes some mistakes. Uh, it, it, makes, it makes a mistake and some mistakes in Nicaragua um, and gets on the wrong side of Congress. And then the Reagan administration almost collapses because of it. So there were mistakes along these lines. There were certainly some concerns about targeted assassinations, uh, mining of harbors that, uh, that ended up um, blowing back on both the CIA and the US more broadly. But I would say what these actions end up doing is, is showing the KGB that this was, this was actually a competition and that it forced the KGB not just to conduct offense, but defense now. It was, had to conduct defense in Eastern Europe. So that I think was interesting because the cause KGB now has to start pushing resources into Eastern Europe to protect its flank from what it sees as an offense. Now, obviously, before the administration, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Voice of America were all beaming in to Eastern Europe. But I think with the, as these programs start to ramp up and there's more money pushed, KGB's got to start focusing on protecting its key flank. And I think, you know, the, 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 I don't think the U.S. wins the war, wins the Cold War in the sense of causes the collapse of Soviet Union, or at least there are a lot of other variables. But I think what you can see is, is the playing field starts to level. And again, based on KGB's own assessments, um, it's, it has to completely reorient where it's focusing, what it's doing, and, and which areas it now has to protect. And I think that, that, that made a difference. Uh, the book is Seth Jones, A Covert Action. Reagan, the CIA, and the Cold War struggle in Poland. Seth, thank you very much. It was a great book. I hope everyone goes and buys it, and it was a great conversation. Please join me thank in you. thanking Seth. <laughs>